if you're visiting with us today, and I notice we have several visitors, some are familiar to us and we know where you live. We may come and visit you sometime. Uh, others are from the area. We, we're not sure you're new here. We're, regardless of whether you come from a distance or you're in the neighborhood, we're glad you're here today and hope that you have worshiped God and will enjoy our fellowship together. We've been on the subject of humility, and someone has suggested that I'm not qualified uh, <laughs> to speak on this subject, but I'm like the person who can't walk, who constantly talks about the beauties of walking, okay? You can appreciate something even though you're struggling with it. I appreciate your prayer, Steve, when you talked about that because I, not only do you struggle with it, and that's obvious to all of us, but, <laughs> but, but I also struggle with it. And just between me and you, I think they've got a problem too. Uh, we've, just by way of review, hu true humility is not, as some people have said, not thinking of yourself at all or thinking of yourself less than others. Those maybe carry an idea of it, but true humility is living within the created purposes of God. It's the humility that Adam and Eve had before pride came in and was suggested that they themselves could be their own God and that in their own wisdom, they knew better what was good for them than God himself knew. It was when they stepped out of the humility of that relationship for which they had been created and went their own way that humility left this earth and the devil was successful in interjecting pride and so I want you to think about humility as a mindset a way of thinking that says I am created by God think of your createdness well didn't David when looking at his own createdness say I am fearfully and wonderfully made yes but notice what he said I am fearfully and wonderfully made he was not bragging about his physique. He was bragging about the Lord who gave him his body. That's humility. Pride says, look at I, look at me. It's the big I, pride and pride and sin. And we're reviewing a little bit here today because some of you were, weren't here and you need this. <laughs> no, we need to be reminded of humility and what it is. It is not thinking less of yourself and I'm a dog and I'm nothing. It is thinking, God created me, I'm in his image, but he created me. I am not my own. I bought with a price. So what does God want me to do in this situation? We also observe that if we have a sense of our own createdness, then we are going to have more success against sin. When the devil tried to tempt man, he brought in the idea of pride. And any time we sin, we have stepped momentarily out of humility. And we have said, Lord... I don't like your purposes for my life. I like what I can get outside of your purposes. Whether a person looks to steal another man's wife or another woman's husband, they are saying, Lord, I'm not going to be humble any longer. I want this. I'm going after that. Humility then is much larger than we thought. It's much more important than we ever dreamed that it was. And when Jesus came into this world, he came humbly. Do we see what he's doing here? He is coming in the antithesis of pride and he is saying, I am going to interject back into the human experience the possibility of something other than pride and sin. I'm going to interject back into this world the possibility of living humbly before God with a sense of createdness. And that's why Jesus was always saying things like, I can't do anything by myself. Whatever you hear me say, I'm just repeating what the Father said. Whatever you see me do, I've received from the Father and I'm just doing it. That is humility. And when we come to the point in our life where we can say, what I'm thinking right now is what the Father wants me to think. And what I'm doing right now is what the Father wants me to do. We will have that closer walk with Jesus. And we will enter into all of the power that humility brought into this world. For there is more power in the humility of Jesus than in all of the pride of the devil. There is more power in the humility of a simple Christian who understands their createdness and in the purpose of God than all of the atom bombs in this world. For it was in the humility of Jesus that he came to save us. 
He overcame pride. He overcame all temptations, and he lived a sinless life. How did he do that? He never stepped out of humility. He stayed within the will of his father. He said, I and the father are one. The father is always with me. And he makes this same kind of promise to us when he says, happy are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. His very first beatitude says, this is what I'm all about. This is what's been going on. This is what needs to be going on. And of course, then that brings us to our interactions with one another. And by popular request, Kathy's video will be replayed in its entirety. This is the humility within the church. Okay. Oh, man, it's heavy. Yeah. Why did you have to get such heavy? Why flip-flops aren't working? Can we turn or do something? Well, why don't you get some real shoes? Well, I'll be backwards and flip-flops. Okay, all right. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. Well... Danny, this is your office, your chair. Well, let's go. Come on, let's, let's go. go yeah, come way? on, let's go. Grab it's not going to work this way, Danny. Well, Danny, it's not going to work. Try it. Danny, Danny, my hands are in the door. No, it's not uh, going to work. I'm stuck. This okay. is going to be good. Uh, all right. Okay. <sighs> Hate chairs. I haven't been chairing. Ty, you want to give it another try? Yeah, I know you need this. Now you didn't. So. I don't feel like you really gave it a hundred percent on my idea because it wasn't your idea. So what's your idea? My idea is to go through sideways because okay, this all right. Obviously more it won't work. Sideways. It'll never work. I'll even go backwards for you. Okay, all right. Let's see. All right. So look at that. Look at that. It's, see, going, it's hitting the no, door. Denny, it's you're hitting. Not it's hitting that Denny, door. Denny, my it. fingers are getting <sighs> jammed up in here just like that's, it happened with you. See, it's not. It just didn't work, Ty. We're just not going to get that chair in your office. Oh, this is heavy. It is heavy. I'm glad I was here to help you, though. Um, well, thank you. My flip-flops aren't working very well. Can we turn so I can sure. go sideways at sure. least? Sure. Oh, that's so much better. So I was glad I was here today to help you out with this chair. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, let's talk about how we're going to get it through this door. I think, uh, well, what's your idea? I'm not seeing that it's going to work very well sideways or regular. I don't know. What's your idea? It's your chair. It's your office. What would you like to do? Well, I'd like to hear your idea. Denny, you've moved more furniture than I have in your lifetime. I'd really okay, appreciate well, your idea. Okay, well, I think it's pretty simple. We just tilt it back and take it in sideways. I think it'll fit, but um, I'd really right, rather... you want to go with that? No, I'd really rather hear your idea. Are you sure? Mm-hmm. Well, I think if we go through, tilt it sideways so that your hands are right where they are, and you go through backwards, and we wrap it around the door frame, it'd fit in really nice. But I, I'd still like uh, your way, because I think what you th thought so, is a good idea. So maybe a tradi more traditional way furniture moves. I like that. Okay. Uh, but I, I think I'd rather do it your way. Are you sure? Yeah, I think so. All right. Yeah, especially since you're so accommodating. All right, here we go. All right, we're going to tilt it to your right. All right. Nice. Yeah, that was pretty cool. All right. Thank you very much. I no appreciate problem. it. Hey, no worries. I'm glad I was here to okay. help. <laughs> oh, oh, boy. No, that's good. That's good. Uh, some, Paul said in uh, writing to the Corinthians, he said, I have transferred some things in an allegory or figure to Apollos and myself that you might see something. And so I thought it's entirely scriptural that we transfer uh, this to Ty and, and myself so that it's more easy to see uh, the type of humility seldom seen. In Philippians chapter 2, we read about Paul's writing to this church. And the title of this lesson is The Humility of a Sweet Fellowship. And here Paul says to this sweet church that he loves so much, look for what is important to others, not just what's important to you. Have the same attitude among you that Christ Jesus had. Though Christ was divine by nature, he did not think that being equal with deity was something to hold on to. Instead, he emptied himself or humbled himself. Taking on the very nature of a slave, he became like human beings appearing in human form. He humbled himself. He obeyed, though it meant dying, even dying on a cross. What is it that created the sweet fellowship that we enjoy here? Wasn't it Jesus' own humility? How inconsistent then, we who have been saved by his humility, 
by his sinlessness, by his living within the perfect will of God and never stepping out of humility, making him a perfect sacrifice. How inconsistent is it that those of us who have been saved by humility will now continue by our own pride, by our own unconcern for others? Well, that's just so inconsistent. A sweet fellowship comes when there is sweet humility. And the humility of Jesus is the proof of the value of humility. If you doubt, even for a moment, that humility has value, look at the most humble person who ever came onto this earth. Look what he accomplished. He even was humble to death on the cross, saving us from our sins. Therefore, God highly exalted him. But you know, in heaven, he didn't lose his humility. The book of Revelation, while picturing him in many different ways, also pictures him still as a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. An argument for humility is an argument for the value of a human being. Humility is the proof that we value others. Well, wait a minute. I, I love other people. What's the proof? The proof is your humility, that you, as you interact with other people, realize that they too are created by God. And that your interaction now with them is governed by a sovereign God. And that that God has an interest in what you say and what you do at this particular moment. You can step out of that humility and say, I, I'm just on my own here. I'm winging it. I have my own concerns, my own desires. Or you can, like Jesus, remain in the moment with God and see the value of the others around him. He healed them. He valued them. He listened to them. He cared for them. He gave us the ultimate healing of the cross. Now, I have to confess, there's a way of looking at Jesus as, as somebody who came to this earth and kind of went through the motions, and he had kind of a job to do, prefectorally. He, he did it. And there's a way of looking at Jesus like he just couldn't wait to get out of here. Anybody ever have that feeling? That Jesus was just going through it, and he just couldn't wait to get it done? So he could get back to the father. Well, now make no mistake about it. His primary relationship was a vertical one. His primary relationship was with his father. That's what humility does. Humility says, I am created. I am sent. And this is the one who sent me. But it has implications. For that same one who sent me sent others. And how I relate to them is of great concern to the one who sent us all. And so Jesus comes valuing other people. He was not in a hurry to get away from us. He was in a hurry to get back to the Father. How many of you know that unless Jesus comes back, unless you die, you're not going to see God? But oh, how we fear to see God. Jesus did not fear to see God. He was anxious to go to the Father. He was not anxious to go through the suffering of the cross, as we ourselves are not anxious sometimes with the suffering of our last days on this earth. But he said he longed to be with the Father. He prayed in John 17, I want to be with you and to have the glory I had with you from the beginning. But make no mistake about it, Jesus was not in a hurry to get rid of us. And I know this because of how he said goodbye. Did you know how you say goodbye says a lot? Now, you can have such a close friend that you can even joke about this. I have a friend, Sam, I've mentioned before. Sometimes when something comes up and we're on the phone, we recognize something has come up in one of our worlds, and we say, I've got to go by, and the other one says, okay, bye. You know, and it's, it's just a real, it's almost like, okay, bye. You know, it's, it's making a point, uh, trying to be a little cool or something, and we both do that. But the truth is, when we call, sometimes we'll talk an hour or more, and we don't want to stop talking about catching up or whatever it is that's going on. Have you ever thought that how you say goodbye may be a measure of your humility? And remember, humility is tied to how you value other people. So church is over and we run for the door. Well, I'm kind of shy. Okay, you get a pass. But have you ever considered that you might not be valuing the association with other people? Some people say, well, I don't, need, I don't need to go to church. Well, I'm not saying that you have to go to church to be saved. But why wouldn't you want to? Why wouldn't you want to value 
the sweet fellowship that we can have with one another. Well, I know there's some bad in all of us, but isn't there so much more good in all of us? Jesus was not in a hurry to say goodbye. You read John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. He is taking his time saying goodbye. He doesn't want to say goodbye. He, he washes their feet because they're still arguing uh, who's the greatest. And, you know, he's saying you still haven't got that lesson yet. John 13, 12 through 17, we can read about. He says uh, he, he washed their feet. He put on his clothes and returned to his place. And he says, do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth. No servant is greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Notice he's spending time with them. Oh, by the way, there was somebody who was anxious to leave this party. Do you remember? And Jesus said, okay, what you got to do, do quickly. Maybe we shouldn't do quickly. Maybe we should spend some time valuing the presence of someone else God loved enough to give life. To value the presence of someone else from whom we esteem we might learn something if we would slow down and take out the big eye and just think about what God would have me do. Jesus was not anxious to leave this planet. He said, it's better if I go away, though, because if I go, I can send the Holy Spirit. And he says there in 15 and 16 of John, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And his last words were, were to go into all the world and preach the good news. And I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. There is a sense in which Jesus is with us right now, spiritually. There is a sense in which through the Holy Spirit, he is always with us wherever we go. When we leave here, the two or three gathered together, there am I in the midst, gives way to the Holy Spirit, Jesus in us representatively. And until that day when he comes again and we are in his spiritual body presence in heaven, this is Jesus' effort to say, I don't want to say goodbye. Think about your last goodbye with someone you really cared about. Were you anxious to leave? Let's just face it. Jesus is crazy about us. In John chapter 17, he's looking to the Father because in his humility, that's it. And he says, I'm coming to you, but look at these that you gave me. Look, I, I have them. They've been kept by your power. And I pray, Lord, that we might be one and they might be one and that they might see the glory that you and I had from the beginning. I want them with me always. And then he mentions you. And not only do I pray for these alone, but for all them which shall believe on me through their word. Jesus is very fond of you. And humility is the proof of that fondness. It slows down and takes a while and doesn't want to say goodbye. I had a friend call me this week and know that we would all have such a friend. And he said, I've been just getting an urging. And he said, when I get an urging, it might be from the spirit if it keeps recurring. And I just wanted to tell you, that God is so very fond of you, Denny. I felt that was the message that you needed and that I received it to give to you. It's interesting, isn't it, how these things work? And God is so proud of you too. In Romans chapter 8, verse 35 who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Verses 37 through 39. No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced 
that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I know Jesus loved me not just because he died upon the cross. That's the main proof. But he took a long time to say goodbye. And the humble life of Jesus and the value that he placed on everybody around him, small and great, Show me the worth of everybody around me. And it is the proof that we value others. Humility is also the power to heal. It has healing power. Your humility can heal other people. God can, through you and your humility, heal other people. I know many of us came in here and and there's probably not a one person in here that doesn't have some hurt, some, something that someone has done to you in the past or even now is doing to you that is hurting you. And I know without a doubt that every accountable person in here is hurting themselves. Every time we sin, it is a hurt. And Jesus came to heal us of our hurts. In Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 5, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we're healed. There is healing power in humility. It was only humility that kept Jesus in the will of God when in Gethsemane he prayed, Lord, let this pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. It was only staying in the will of God that took him to the cross. And do you see his humility in his trials before the Sanhedrin and before Pilate? Do you see it before the soldiers and the beatings? Do you feel it as he is crucified? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Do you see the healing power of humility? Sometimes when there is a problem in our lives, we feel we need to attack that problem. And it may be, and undoubtedly is, all we really need to do is humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift us up. In Luke chapter 9 and verse 62, Jesus, in speaking of the kingdom, said, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Before you can serve in the kingdom of God, you've got to look ahead. If you're looking back at your hurts, those people who hurt you, those sins that you committed of which you have shame, if that's where your focus is, you need healing. And only through the humility of Jesus do you have, uh, we have an opportunity to be healed. And Jesus here is saying to be really fit for service in the kingdom, you can't look back. Well, how do you get past the hurt that keeps us looking in that rearview mirror? It's only humbling ourselves before the Lord. It's only through the gift of Jesus' own humility, through the power of the Spirit, that we can begin to see ourselves in the purposes of God in spite of what went on back there. A good counselor often asks when discussing past hurts, often asks the person that he or she is counseling, how do you see now what happened to you then making you what you are in the kingdom of God now. In other words, how has that hurt been redeemed in some powerful way so that it made you who you are today? Because there is nothing that has happened to us that God does not have the power. If we humble ourselves before him to exalt us in the very thing that would bring us down if we focused on that. Jesus said, no one looking back is ready for service. But you can be ready for service. You can accept the forgiveness of Jesus. You can forgive not only those who hurt you, you can forgive yourselves for your own hurt. Because most of it is self-inflicted, amen? Most of it. Jesus surprised us all when Peter thought he was going way over the mark when he talked about how willing he was to forgive people seven times, Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times. And Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times or 70 times seven. 
It's a definite number for an indefinite amount. What he was really saying to Peter is, there is no end to how much forgiveness you should have in your heart toward other people. Now, that, that doesn't mean it's easy, and it doesn't mean that some hurts just go away because we snap our fingers. Sometimes there's a process. Almost always there is a process that we go through. But there is victory in and over our hurts. These words of Jesus is how God wants us to feel about those who hurt us. And it's also how God wants us to feel about ourselves and how we've hurt ourselves. It's also how God sees us. Jesus says this. This is how we should see ourselves. Do you want to grow in humility? Then that closer walk with Jesus is the only way. Listening to his words and how he describes his life, seeing the power that humility brought to him, the power to heal all the people around him, not just in physical healing, but more importantly, in spiritual and emotional and mental health. He brought life to them. And it was his humility that allowed him to stop and value them long enough for them to feel the power of humility. Can this church be a part of restoring the humility of Jesus and the power that the early church knew in this humility? I believe we can. If you're subject to the invitation, you're not a child of God, would you repent of your sins, confess Jesus' name, and be baptized for the remission of your sins, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and walk closer to Him? As a child of God, understand the power and the value of humility as we think about Jesus and we think about our lives.